Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today is another Throwback Thursday. That is because Forgotten Weapons is a bit over 10 years old at this point, and looking back at some of the early videos I posted I realized there are some real gems back there that just didn't get a lot of exposure when they came out because the channel was so small at the time. So I figured in recognition of our 10 year anniversary I'd repost a few of those that I think are worthy of it. Uh, one of them, what we have today, is an interview that I did at the 2011 Phoenix SAR West gun show with Mr. Dolph Goldsmith. Uh, we did a, posted a couple snippets of a different interview with Dolph uh, a couple weeks ago. Same gentleman, um, a fantastic expert on machine guns and the NFA community in the United States, author of some seven different books on various machine guns. Uh, he, I believe, was 83 at the time of this interview. Today, I believe, he, if I'm not mistaken, he has just turned 93. Still kicking, uh, still sharp. In what we're talking about in this particular interview is, well, a number of things I think are interesting. Um, we talk about what people are collecting and why, and what, what different groups collect what different sorts of guns, and how that's changed over time. In particular we're talking about uh, how the machine gun collecting community has changed, how uh, he'll reference back to the days when it was just foolishness perhaps to buy any machine gun that would cost more than $20 or $25, lest you be completely ripped off and why that was the case. Uh, neat little anecdote about the uh, heavy machine gun his aunt got from the government in the mail after World War One. That's kind of neat. Um, I got the chance to ask Dolph what, what gun he would take today. If he could have any one interesting modern gun what would it be? And I had, I'll be honest, I'd completely forgotten about this until I went back through the video in preparation for this. Uh, his answer was exactly the same as my answer, which is kind of cool, uh, the PKM. And he'll explain why, and he also has a neat anecdote about uh, some testing the US Army did with the PKM that I hadn't known about. So I will finally preface this by saying that audio quality has never been my strong suit, and it was really not my strong suit filming this interview. There's a lot of background noise, by the end there's trains going by and all sorts of nonsense. Uh, it was so bad that I did in fact subtitle Dolph uh, in this video when it originally came out. So I've left those subtitles in place. Uh, they'll, I apologize for the audio quality, there's totally nothing that I can do about it now ten years later, but thanks to those subtitles you should have no trouble understanding what Dolph is saying. Anyway, uh, I will at this point turn it over to ten year ago me and Mr. Dolph Goldsmith. Enjoy. Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video episode on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian. Today I have the great privilege of speaking with Dolph Goldsmith. Dolph is a genuine expert on the Vickers, the Maxim, and the Browning machine guns, having written uh, four volumes on the Browning and a, a book each on the, the Vickers and the Maxim. Definitely the, the best reference guides on those guns that are out there. So I'd like to thank you for speaking with us today. Well, thank you very much for asking me to come out here. So, having a good time at the show today? Oh, well, we, yeah. Well, so far it's been a little chilly. A little bit. It'd be better, be better in a few, uh, little an hour or so. Yeah. I had a pretty good show, so it fair amount. All right. So a lot of interesting things I hadn't seen before. Yeah, there's some cool stuff here. Yeah, really interesting stuff. A lot of good stuff is coming out of the woodwork now that the economy is slow and people are needing to raise money, so you see a lot of good stuff coming. Yeah. that I have never seen before. Really? Even yeah. stuff you haven't seen? Oh yeah, a lot of stuff I haven't seen. Cool. So, you know, there are a lot of people my age, or kind of my age, who don't have... There's all sorts of things that were around when you were collecting that we're never going to see. As, well, what, are, you know, what are some of the more interesting things that you've seen that you think would be cool to, for, for some of the young guys like us to know about? Well, it's difficult to say. It's all pretty interesting, but... You know, you don't see many of the old guns around anymore, you know, like the Hotchkiss, Schwarzloaf, and Belly, any of that kind of gun. You don't see them around. Most everything you see is modern stuff. And of course, you see a lot of Vickers and Maxim and Brownings, but that's one reason for that is because they have the made aftermarket guns made on new side plates. And right. before you, while you still could do that, and uh, also the semi-automatics. And that's going to be a big thing coming up from now. It's the semi-automatics for two reasons. Number one. They'll be more affordable. Number two, ammunition is going to be harder and harder to get because a foreign country's surplus is always high enough. And um, they're legal in many places where they, uh, where full automatics wouldn't be legal. So that is probably the big thing 
the machine guns, but it's still about the same as shooting a live one. Yeah. But what people will do, they'll probably have one or two live guns, and I mean, full autos, and the rest of the guns will be semi autos now. They're making almost every gun you can think of Brands and ZVs and MG 34s. I don't know about the 42, I haven't seen the semi auto 42. Yeah, I think uh, that's that. Um, uh, of course, the Maxim Vickers and Browning, and so all the submachine guns that they have done in North America. Right. And they all made in semi automatic form. They may look like a machine gun, but they're not a machine gun. So, well, then, another thing that I think will get people interested, uh, people will become interested in the old mechanical machine guns that had operated. Yeah. And I'm, I'm uh, Robert Siegel and I are working on a book that's going to cover a lot of the old stuff. No. It has not been written about much before. That's true, there aren't many reasons. Well, there's not too much written about that. So, I think that's still not going to be the future. Us for the old stuff, well, sooner or later, the people that have it are going to die. And then the relatives, generally speaking, prefer to have the money. Right. And it'll come on the market again. Okay. But the only problem is prices are so much higher. Right. When I was a kid, you could buy a maximum for $25. You can buy a show show for twenty dollars. You can buy a Lewis for twenty dollars. What you know, twenty nine dollars. I knew one fella. He collected machine guns, and it was his dictum that he would never pay over fifty dollars for any machine gun. And he could have a very large collection. I wish we could still. Be. And that was partially due to the fact that everybody thought they were legal. Okay. They didn't realize that they were legal in well, in most states. Uh, they did not realize that, and they thought, well, machine guns are illegal, you hear from New York, they were, of course, they were New Jersey, they've always been illegal, so they went to Illinois, and they, they didn't realize that was only a state regulation, not a federal regulation. Yeah. You can, you can, as long as you qualify and you pay the tax and the people will sign for you, you can have a machine gun in a state that's legal, but people right. didn't realize that until the internet brought that back to their attention. Yeah. And um, since then, uh, the interest in collecting machine guns has been gone, has gone up tremendously. Now, there was also another thing that uh, held back the machine gun collecting in the early days. It was a stigma attached to it. Machine guns were gangster weapons. And uh, a, 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 you know, a lot of us, Gun collectors who prided themselves on the correctness of things said, You can't own a machine gun, that's a gangster one. You don't own anything else. You can have a Springfield, or you can have a Civil War carbine, or you can have a, uh, any a Luger or anything that you can't have a machine gun. And that stigma has gone away to some degree, people don't think about it. But in the 50s, in the 40s, and 50s, the gangster days of the 30s were still very much in people's minds. And now it is almost like an ancient history. Yeah, no people don't think about it, and uh, and machine guns are not really being used in crimes. Right, it's pistols. If anybody going to commit a crime, it's a with a with a weapon, it'll be a handgun. Yeah, it's certainly uh, not going to be a, a Vickers or a Browning. <laughs> you can't because of the concealability and right. all the rest of it. And you know, the funny funny thing about machine guns is that they were really rather than. They were more area suppression weapons in the military than they were out of weapons that were designed initially just to kill a lot of people. They were there more to keep everybody's heads down. We had an interesting demonstration we used to put out in the army. There'd be one fellow with an M1 rifle and a fellow with a BAR. And everybody thought, oh, the guy with the BAR is going to knock down all their targets. Well, he shoot. He shoots four times as much ammunition. But the guy with the good shot with the M1 had all his targets down before the machine gun had them down. And the only quarter of the ammunition. So, um, so the, the stigma of, of the machine gun that it had when I was a kid collecting it, you know, they, uh, that existed to some degree as some kind of a stigma, but not on Maxims and Vickers. Those were not gun machine guns. They were war souvenirs. Okay. Uh, the, 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 law, the law in 34 was written mostly against the Thompson, and nobody really cared much about the Maxims and Vickers and all that. They were just things people brought back from the war, and uh, the government brought back and gave to people. Yeah, there are a lot of them handed out to EAB base. True, my aunt got one. She was high up <laughs> in the Red Cross in World War One. She had a high position in the Red Cross. And uh, she was sent one after the war 
came in our railway express one day, <laughs> and, 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 and with a tag tied on it, and just not even in a box, just loose. And, and, you know, and it came in, and she, what's this? And she said, well, a tag on it says, in appreciation for your service during World War One or the Great War, whatever they called it. And I said, and Amy, have you still got the tag? Uh, I threw it away. Oh, what a shame! <laughs> yeah. I still have the gun, though. Nice. I got. To, I talked her. I talked her son out of it. Okay. Gave him a twenty-two for it. <laughs> that's and amazing. And it's a mint edition MG08. Nice. And that's how they handed these things out as souvenirs. But they took the bolts out. Came without the bolt. Okay. Not that that would. Well, uh, you wouldn't have been able to make a maximum bolt. It wouldn't be too easy. To no, make. not to make them. But uh, there were the big guys. There were people that actually would have attempted to make. And you know, they found they couldn't done it. Okay. Yeah. It would have been a difficult job. Right. So, if there were one that you could pick up today, what would you really want to have? Um, uh, any one gun oh, yeah. I would like to have today? Well, in the old ones, I think I'd like to have an Italian Novelli. I've owned a couple of them in my life, but I don't have one now, and it's kind of a unique gun. I have a Felix that can be converted to shoot with 762 by 39 ammunition. Okay. And that's available. 6.5 yeah. Italian is not. Yeah. Awesome. And and the modern gun, the gun I would love to have, because I think it's the epitome of machine gun design, is the PKM. Okay. What's so great about the PKM is that the designers used every facet, every bit of the recoil energy to make the gun work. They put the belt feet slide over to the right so that the recoil energy would run the belt across. You would probably drag a 250 round belt across the ground because of the power. The extraction, now the MG34, 42, M60, M249, 240, all of them have to push a round out of a link. Right. Now, if the ammunition is dirty or rusty or wet or dented or the inks are not perfect, it still very often have the bolt go part way forward, unable to push the round out. All you have is a recoil spring. Right. PCAM doesn't do that. It uses the recoil energy to pull the, the round out of the lid and drop it down into a little trough and all the bolt, bolt has to do is push it forward. No work at all. No work in loading the belt across, no work in extracting, uh, no work in uh, chambering the round. Okay. And as a result, it just always works. I have one of the, that's, and it's a basic, very simple concept. Now if you take almost every machine gun, the, the spring, the recoil spring, which can be weak, can be uh, stuck or can be uh, right. broken, has to do most of the work. Yeah, it does. A lot of them, most of the work, but in many cases, a lot of the work. And uh, when you depend on a spring to do the work, when the, when the force of recall could do it, uh, I think you're missing a bit. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and that's why I think the PKM is the greatest design. And I know somebody who, the U.S. Army wanted to replace the tank machine gun about 30 years ago. They had a two, uh, they call it 240, uh, the, the, the M73. Yeah, yeah, they had that. It was a dismal thing. And they thought, well, we could use the PKM. And they converted, the government converted four PKMs to 762 by the, uh, you know, NATO out. They worked fine. It took months of work. It's very difficult to convert. Very difficult to do that. Okay. And they did it. They worked fine. And they, Brought them to Fort. The story I have is they brought them to Fort Knox mm -hmm. to be tested in the tank program, and the colonel in charge of the tank program said, "A Russian machine gun on an American tank? Not as long as I'm in the army." <laughs> and uh, the whole thing got scrapped. I said, "Well, what happened to the guns? Well, they didn't need them anymore. They destroyed them." I said, "My gosh! After all that work." Should have put one in Aberdeen and one in Springfield Armory and rock, one at Rock Island and one at the Marine Corps Museum and they'd be yeah. available to students of weapons. No, they destroyed them. No. Yeah. And that was a very good idea and it didn't fly because it was not invented here. And that's what I always find ideas. wrong. NIH just seems to be everything. If it wasn't invented here, it can't be any good. And that is not the case. Yeah. And foreign countries are very different. The, the British picked up the bread. Although they had a very good uh, gun, which was called the Vickers Vickers Mercy, which is just as good as the Bren, yeah. but they I thought the Bren was a little better. Yeah. And even though it was a foreign gun, they picked up on that. 
and they, they picked up on the Maxim, which was made by, by an American. And the Germans, they had their own design, so they picked up on the more guns, and the Russians will pick up anything that's better than what they got. But not us, and we'll do that, and that's what I find is a very bad thing. Now maybe got a little bit better on the M249 and the M240, because those are actually in Belgium. It's still basic American design, grounding design, so. Right. And uh, we should study more with foreign countries and can pick up some good ideas rather than just, you know. <laughs> yeah, just look Make sure that. they call it the mortgage syndrome too. How are the engineers going to pay their mortgages if we adopt foreign designs? And that's something that's been going on for a long time. Yeah. So that's, uh, we're certainly trying to uh, publish a lot of information on American guns and every foreign gun. Yeah. Well, you know, as far as collecting goes, uh, I think it's what I think is very interesting about gun collecting. When I was a kid. An M1 rifle, um, a carbine, the stuff that was current at the time, all the old timers looked at that in this day, that's all modern stuff. They liked Sharps rifles and, and, and 4570s and Spencers and, and, and Winchesters and Colts and stuff. Now, the people, the young guys today, they like the modern plastic stuff, the, the, the black rifles. That's everybody's hot on that. And the old timers say, oh, that's all new stuff. <laughs> you got to go back to the good old days when they had stuff like M1s and that carbines and, uh, and, and uh, uh, old Strumgewehrs and things, which now is considered that. Right. But it was the state of the art when I was a kid. And, and, and only a di totally different group of people collect the true antiques, which is the Spencers and the Sharps and all that. And in another 50 years, people will be looking back on AR-15. Yeah, that, that, well, that, that, that's the only right. thing. Now, now, now we got caseless ammunition. Look at this. You're shooting something with a brass cartridge case, wasteful. <laughs> that's not modern technology. That's antique. We're going to have caseless ammunition. Yeah. With a, just a, a bullet with a little powder charge behind it, which consumes itself, so you don't need right. a, uh, don't need a, um, a um, of course, that's a very difficult technology right. because what the heat of the gun that is going to, you have to have something to insulate that powder from the heat of the gun. So right. maybe they'll figure out something that they'll make a powder that won't blow up if it's exposed to heat, yeah. only if it's fired by an electric spark or something. They'll probably come up with something like that and put our current guns all into the category of antique. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's fantastic. I appreciate your time. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> cool. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, check out ForgottenWeapons.com. We have a whole bunch of information on all sorts of interesting pieces and uh, cool videos with people like Mr. Goldsmith here. Thanks for watching.